So good morning, everyone. I'm Maggie Moore. I'm a senior planner and growth management at PSRC. And today we are holding our Passport to 2044 event on economic development. And this is one in a series of our Passport to 2044 events. So we had a kickoff uh, in June in partnership with the Washington State Department of Commerce, as well as MRSC to really talk about the comprehensive planning process, the resources that are available from our agencies and organizations to planners from across the region, as well as um, what our plan review process looks like and what we're looking for during that process. And really the main audience for these events are planners, consultants, and staff working um, at local jurisdictions on the updates to local comprehensive plans. All of the materials from these sessions, so the ones that have already happened, including our climate session in August, as well as recordings from those events are available on our website. Uh, and then, as you can see, we have a lot more events scheduled and soon to be scheduled coming up. So we are going to launch registration for events on transportation, housing, and equity in the next few weeks. So please um, stay on the lookout for those. And then we have other topics scheduled or soon to be scheduled. So if you have a topic that you think is applicable to your jurisdiction and others, you don't see it on here, please reach out to us. Um, we are happy to look into that or what other resources we can help with for those. So today specifically, we're going to be talking about economic development. So after these, this introduction, I'll be passing it over to Craig Hellman, who's our Director of Data at PSRC, who will be talking about our regional economy and what trends are happening and what we're seeing there. Then we'll pass it over to Jason Thibodeau, um, who is a pro our Program Manager of Economic Development at PSRC, to really talk about what data resources are available to you as a local jurisdiction, as well as um, developing local economic development policies. And we also are joined by Rob Alice Allen from Pierce County, to really talk about their process at the county for that as well. And just like our other events, the recording for today's meeting, as well as all of the presentations will be shared on our website and an email will be sent out to everyone who's registered after the event. So those will be available to you. Also, if you have a question at any time, please ask in the Q&A. We have Liz Underwood Boltman from PSRC who will be monitoring that Q&A. And she'll ask those questions to our presenters periodically throughout today's event. So before we get started, I want to begin by talking about some resources we have available from PSRC. So we really want to help you create local plans that advance our regional goals. And to do that, we have created a series of resources and guidance documents to really help with that process. So as you may know, Vision 2050 is our regional plan for growth. It really sets the stage for local comprehensive plans. Um, and this plan really puts an emphasis on housing and affordability. It created a new chapter on climate change. So our event in August really talked more about climate change and resilience um, and what's new there from both PSRC as well as the Department of Commerce. And it expands policies on equity and mitigating displacement. So as our region continues to grow, what the stress on our local communities is. So to here at PSRC, we review local plans. And so as you adopt your plans at the end of 2024, you'll submit those to Commerce and PSRC um, for that review process. And so we review and certify, and that makes jurisdictions eligible for transportation funding from our agency. And to help with that process, we have created a plan review manual as well as consistency, a consistency tool for local comprehensive plans. So this is a great resource to really see what we're looking for during that review process and really ensuring that the emphasis that has come about in Vision 2050 can really be reflected in those local plans. So this is a great resource as you're developing those plans kind of to use throughout the process. Um, and then to really ensure that you're um, looking at all of the things that we'll be looking for during plan review. We also have a series of resources that help um, talk about Vision 2050 in a variety of ways. So kind of set up for different types of audiences. 
I'll draw your attention to the top right, our Vision 2050 policy matrix, as well as a summary of all of the updates from Vision 2040 to Vision 2050. Uh, and just as all of our other presentations, this one will be available online after the event. So you'll be able to click through those links um, and find any documents you're looking for. We also are releasing, releasing um, guidance documents specific to different topic areas. So you'll see there, we have an economic development element guide. Jason will be talking about that later today. Um, we also just released a draft of our climate change guidance, as well as guidance on TOD and centers. And then we have a number of guidance documents that will be coming out this fall, and those will be really coordinating with um, webinars that we'll be hosting in the coming months. So there is a lot available on our website. I will mention we did recently launch a new website. So if you're having trouble with links or finding something, please reach out and we can connect you with those. Uh, we really hope that these are valuable resources, but we also wanna be a resource to you. So reach out if you ever um, want to talk about what's available or your local planning process. So I am going to turn it over to Craig Hillman um, to start talking about um, this topic specifically on economic development. Thanks, Maggie. I will start sharing my screen here. Um, hopefully everyone will see it. And I will, um, although I'm told no one can hear it, but um, with economic activity happening outside my window as they're working on the waterfront, there continues to be jackhammering and dropping things into um, big trucks. So if you hear things, I apologize for that, or if I seem distracted, that's it. Um, Maggie already mentioned um, everything in here is if you have questions as I go through the slides, please enter them in the Q&A. Uh, Liz will be kind of monitoring that. And at the end of my short little presentation here, I'm happy to, to answer any of those Q&As that come up. Just have a few slides to kind of take you through kind of the mix of some population, housing, and job trends that we're seeing in the region. Um, just kind of to ground us all and give us some context, we are planning for about 5.8 million people in our region by 2050. In 2020, we had about 4.3 million people in our region. So we're looking at about another 1.5 million people in 30 years. Do the math, that's about 50,000 people a year. Um, despite the impacts of a global pandemic, the dark purple line here is showing you where we're at in population observed. And then the, the lighter purple line is showing our forecast out to 2050. So if you can see roughly, right, despite the pandemic, we're actually slightly above the growth forecast of where we were at in 2022. We're at about 4.4 million people right now in, in 2022. A vast majority of our population growth is accounted for by migration. The, the darker purple line on the bottom, these bars here kind of shows you that kind of natural increase. You can see how that natural increase has actually been decreasing over time. Our birth rate has been declining. And so you can see even pre-pandemic, that purple was decreasing. You can really start to see the impact of, of the pandemic and the impact on an increased number of deaths, as well as a reduction of birth rate. You can see how much smaller that purple um, bar has gotten. But you can kind of look at these ones and you can see the vast majority of the growth in our region is driven by migration. And a big reason people migrate to our region is a robust, healthy economy, as well as our beautiful natural settings that are around us. I'd made that comment. If you kind of think about, if you just straight line the growth out between 2020 and 2050, we would be adding about 50,000 people a year. And if you look at kind of this line here at 50,000 people, even in the last year, we surpassed that 50,000 line. Um, Coming out of the Great Recession, you can see how much lower things were, and you can definitely see that impact. We were basically barely growing in terms of anything in terms of migrating to the region, but that definitely as the economy rebounded, we have definitely seen a, a, a strong return to migration to our region for jobs. With all that population growth, we're estimating we need about a million new housing units by 2050. And so kind of following that same thing that I was just showing you on the previous slide, you can see the darker green in this case is the observed number of housing units. And then the lighter green line is the forecast for those, those housing units. And you can see we're basically right on the line kind of where we're at in housing units. If you do that same sort of math um, as you work out and do the calculation, right, it's about 33,000 housing units a year um, we would need to add to the region. So if I kind of, kind of look at our next slide here, you can see 
In 2022, we added about 28,000 housing units. So we're a little bit below um, where we're at there, but we're definitely growing robustly. But you can see almost 70% of new housing units in this region have been added in the last decade have been multifamily housing units. You can kind of see the different colors. Once again, you can see the production coming out of the Great Recession, um, well under 10,000 units. And you can see where we're at um, as we hit into the 2020s. Despite the pandemic, a lot of the, the construction was going on, right? And so we continued to see growth in the early, <clears throat> excuse me, in the last two years, despite all that was going on in the region. I should say really the world. Um, and so then as we kind of look at the job growth, and I have two slides to try to highlight this. Um, and I would say here, the region has finally returned to our job levels that we had in 2019. If you kind of look at, this is an annual change. So this is as the end of July. So this is each year. Um, and you can see compared to the previous year at the end of July. So the impact of the, the pandemic here, that bar is down 176,800, almost 177,000 jobs disappeared between 2019 and 2020 due to the pandemic. In these last couple of years, you can kind of see this bar almost mutes it, but in the last year, we added almost 100,000 jobs to our region. So in the last two years, we've actually added 184,000 jobs to our region. So this bar was down 177,000, these two add up to 184,000. So we just finally got back to where we're at in 2019. So if you kind of look at the same sort of layout, that now in this case, the darker orange is the observed, and then the lighter orange is the forecasted job growth. We're forecasting jobs out to 2050, be about 3.2 million jobs in the region. You can see where we're kind of at. Um, I like to highlight to people, you. You all be an economic development folks kind of see the V shaped. We, we heard a lot early in the pandemic whether the, re, the impacts of the recession would be a V shaped or not. You can see a rapid drop and much back to a rapid increase. You kind of are tracking where the line is at. We're right basically at where we're at in 2019. But of course, we were forecasting that we would continue to grow jobs. Um, and so you can imagine we're about a year behind where we originally forecasted. Now, having said that, we forecast out, you see this line is straight. Um, we know cycles, right? You have the ups and you have the downs. And in the end, the ups and downs kind of work their way out to kind of a rough line. But you can kind of see, despite a global pandemic, we we're actually pretty close to where we are at in terms of our job forecast by now. Um, but not all job sectors have fully recovered. And these bars, and you can look at them later and you'll have the links to the slides as well. You can kind of see them, but I just went with the kind of the 10 high level job sectors that you can get from the QCW data. And if you look, certain sectors are up. Um, and in, in this case, it's July, 2019 compared to July, 2022. So you can see construction, wherever the bar in 22 is higher, it's, it's growth over where we're at pre-pandemic. So you can see the construction, education, health services, this one, it's almost, um, I don't know how your eyes see it, this 2022 bar slightly higher, but you can see, and I would point out leisure and hospitality as an example. It's been the one of the hardest hit job sectors as a result of the pandemic, and it's still not back to where it was at in 2019, despite the fact it's grown quite a bit. If we were to look, have looked at this bar a year ago, it was below 150,000 jobs. So we've had pretty strong job growth even in the last year, but we are still a good 50,000 jobs below where we are at in 2019. Workforce, labor force is a big issue here in trying to fill those jobs. And you can also see a big impact on manufacturing where we still in 2022 are down below where we're at in 2019. Whereas you can look and see between the, the Amazons and the Microsofts are kind of in between in the, these kind of two sectors here. And so you have the professional business services and information, definitely some of the, the larger growing sectors as well. Probably not too much of a surprise. Um, unemployment rate is back down to pre-pandemic levels. So where you're at at the end of this bar here, we are at a little under 3.3% unemployment rate. So we're well under a 4% unemployment rate. See, really for a good five, six years, the region had been below a 5% unemployment rate in the region. And you can see once again, that impact of the recession, so, or sorry, the pandemic in the spring of 2020, it jumped to almost 18%. 
And it took about a year for it to get back down below 5%, but you can see the kind of steady decline back to, like I said, this is about 3.3% unemployment rate for the region as of June of 2022. And probably the last sort of interesting one, and, and I'll caveat this because the data is still continuing to change. So I took a snapshot. This is from census data. In 2010, 2015, and 2020, and you can see kind of the overall work from home percentages. And the interesting one is if you just kind of look between 2010 and 2020, work from home doubled. It went from 5% to 10%. Um, but this is region, this is ACS um, information, census information that's out. We track this information through a variety of other sources and it continues to go up and down. Um, and it really, really, really varies by your job sector. I would use an example just in an organization like ours. Several of us are in the office today. Far more of us are working from home today. And so we have a pretty strong continued work from home um, group here. And so you can kind of see that continuing. And with that, that's kind of my last set of intro slides into the things that are going on. So Liz, I'm happy to turn it over to Q&A and I can stop sharing. Great. Uh, looks like we've got a couple questions. So um, in terms of your data on housing, um, does the housing unit number include the deficit we already have? The deficit compared to? Um, I believe it's under production of housing sort of in the long over the long term. That So what I'm showing in those numbers is the, is the total housing units. And so for our 2050 forecast that is showing how many housing units we would have to have for the amount of people living here in 2050. Um, so, so I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, I might not be understanding the question, um, but yes, we definitely need to have strong, robust um, housing unit growth to catch up to what is already a deficit so that we don't fall further behind. Great, um, and I'll just flag, well, we're doing a couple sessions on housing in the near future, so we'll definitely dive a little bit more into some of the housing data and needs too. Um, another question, does the jobs data account for home-based businesses? It does. Great. <laughs> um, and then uh, a final question here, uh, did you say we need 3.2 million more jobs by, uh, by what time? So, um not 3.2 million more jobs. That's actually the total number of jobs in 2050 is 3.2 million. So it's about a million more jobs over what we have today. So think about a million jobs in the next 30 years. Or at this point, I guess it would be 28 years. Great. Well, I think that's wrapping up on questions for Craig. Um, I know uh, Jason also has a couple more data resources he can provide, but um, I think Craig provided his contact info if you have more specific questions for him too. Um, so maybe we will pass it over to Jason now. Jason's our program manager for economic development, um, and we'll be giving an overview of uh, the resources that we have available specific to economic development. Good morning. Um... I'm Jason Thibodeau, Program Manager for our Economic Development work at, here at PSRC, and I'm going to provide some information on how specifically to help how you can develop an economic development element as part of your comp plan planning process. Um, I'm going to reference very heavily our Economic Development Element Guide, which Maggie mentioned earlier as a foundation for this presentation. We developed and presented this, uh, published this in February of this year. It's available right now on our website, and it's a good this presentation is a good supplement to that. It provides some additional detail uh, beyond what I'll cover here today, but it tracks really closely to it. And so there's two main areas that I'm going to cover here are some data sources. Craig gave a really good foundation on some regional data, um, but we have some good, what we think are good data resources for you and your local community to look at uh, and dig into when you're developing better understanding of your of your uh, local economy and help to establish some policies. And then we're going to talk about those policies as well, based upon vision, cross-referencing those data sources that we're talking about. So next slide, Maggie. Great. Um, yeah, so we're going to start with the data sources that we've identified that are useful for understanding your local economy and how to identify some areas to focus on for your economic development policies. Next slide, Maggie. 
So all the data sources that we're going to highlight are organized around these five categories that you see here that are helpful in understanding more about your local economy. They include business and job mix, commuting patterns, workforce characteristics, some equity considerations, and availability and affordability of space. And for each, I'm gonna cover how these data sources can be useful in your planning, how to access them, and show some examples of what this data can look like for your community as well. Next slide. Starting with a business and jobs mix, a key to understanding your local economy is knowing what types of jobs and businesses you have and their impact on your community. Covered employment estimates, um, which we leverage uh, greatly here, refer to those jobs that are on a payroll and are covered by state unemployment insurance. Estimates here are provided by industry categories at a high level or a more detailed level and can be helpful to understand the types and number of jobs that you have in your community. And of course, each type of job has different needs in terms of zoning, in terms of workforce, in terms of spaces that they need. And uh, the State Employment Security Department is the owner of this data, but we have a relationship with ESD, so we have access to this. Um, and an easy place to access the uh, covered employment estimates for the region and for jurisdictions is on PSRC's website. It's published on an annual basis and, and is provided at the regional, county, and city census tract level. Next slide. And this is a sample showing you uh, an example breakdown at the higher level industry categories. You can see the mix of jobs in this example community, which again can be helpful in terms of thinking about land use, about local needs, your and your local economic development goals. Manufacturing jobs provide different local economic benefits than say retail jobs, as well as requiring different zoning spacing, as well as lo being located in different parts of your community as well. As I mentioned, more data is available at more specific industry levels beyond these. These high-level categories um, have subcategories that can be an analyzed. And the one that, that's most notable that, that ends up having a lot of different things in there is the services category. This is a, a broad category set and includes things such as healthcare, IT, finance, accommodations, et cetera, all very, look very different as far as what their needs are for your planning. Next slide. In addition to looking at the different categories of jobs, uh, these broader categories, it's helpful to know more about the specific employers in your community. There's not a, a great data source that will easily provide a full inventory of all the businesses that you'd have in your community. Qualitative information is often very helpful um, in understanding more specifically what you have. You may be aware already of these major employers, especially in smaller communities about the businesses that you have. You may be able to access some of this information through your local business licensing division as well. And in addition, organizations in the region work to develop lists of top employers. The I have on, on the screen here um, logos for the four county ADOs, the Associate Development Organizations. These are county level public private partners around economic development. And they frequently do surveys and put together lists of major employers in the region. So next slide. Provided here some, some links and we'll share these slides, you'll be able to link directly to them. Some of those top employer lists um, from those ADOs around the region. And in addition, I found a really good uh, resource to be the Puget Sound Business Journal. They publish annually their book of lists that identify companies across many different industries and sub-industries. There's lots of very discrete lists of different types of businesses. Then, and this can be helpful not just to learn about businesses that you may have in your specific communities, but also in adjacent communities or at the regional level to help provide more insight into the businesses that we have and, and potentially give you some thoughts and opportunities about uh, your business expansion goals. Next slide. So with an understanding of what businesses and types of businesses you have in your community, it's also important to think about what goals you want to achieve. The regional economic strategy, which was adopted in December of 2021, highlights key export industries that we have in the region. And these are industries that are unique to our region and provide goods and services for export for markets around the world. 
Our region competes for these jobs and businesses, and they help to drive dollars into our local economy. And understanding these regional industries, the subsectors, the supply chains, as well as the organizations that are helping to grow these industries in the region can help inform your goals for business development and business growth in your community. And the regional economic strategy is another resource that we have available on our website. We have some uh, regional industry clusters here listed that we analyze, and there's a lot more information um, about them in that document. Next slide. Another source for understanding your local business mix and the economic benefits that they provide is looking at taxable retail sales data. It provides an indication of consumer spending in your community, both by residents as well as visitors. So where's the money coming in? The Washington Department of Revenue's website provides quarterly and annual reports at different geographic levels for these. And we next slide and we'll show a little example of this. Here's a sample of the kind of information that's available. It shows taxable sales for various categories, and it can help inform you about the activities that are happening in your community. And of course, there are dramatically different price points at play here. Cars are, are you know, more expensive than, say, beer. Um, but if you have goals for expanding a commercial area to help provide more goods and services for your local population, understanding the taxable retail sales can help understand what economic impact you might have from this, how well you're doing in meeting those local needs. Next slide. So now we're gonna to touch upon some commuting pattern data. This data can help you recognize two important economic drivers in your community. The jobs that you have, which may be filled by workers from outside your community, as well as the workers that you have living in your community, regardless of where they work, whether they work in your community or they're commuting other places. The first high level data point uh, we want to highlight is jobs housing ratio. And this is a number that reflects the number of jobs um, divided by the number of housing units. And as the region as a whole, you see in the graphic on the right and the top left, uh, the region as a whole has a 1.31 jobs for every housing unit. And you know, house, there's a lot of factors that are important here. Household size is an important factor. How many people are living in households? Some households have people that are, are and are not working, people are retired, students, et cetera. So, but this can provide a starting point for understanding the high level mix in your community compared with other local communities or compared at the regional level. And you can see there's some variation. Um, across this. And of course, you know, it's a difficult, it's difficult to have specific targets, but it can provide, provide really important context when you're thinking about the mix of jobs and housing in your community. Next slide. What may be more actionable is data regarding workforce commute patterns in your community. And this is a data source that I really like and I advocate for people to look at all the time. Understanding where people live compared to where they work can help inform both your housing goals as well as your job growth goals. This data helps identify where jurisdictions residents work and what industries they work in. Commute patterns uh, also have transportation system implications that can help jurisdictions make informed decisions on how to grow and sustain the transportation network. And the census, it's got a longer name here, the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamic Survey. Uh, the, uh, what I find a pretty easy to use tool uh, on the census website is more commonly referred to as on the map. And so next, we'll go to the next slide and show some examples of that. Here is some snapshot. There's a lot of ways to slice and dice this information. Uh, and here's some examples of that, uh, of the tool, what's available in this tool. And the top left, and I've, I've picked, I just, you know, randomly picked Gig Harbor as an example to use. The top left is an important inflow outflow. So here what you're seeing is that there are a certain number of people in Gig Harbor that both live and work in Gig Harbor. It's about 420, um, about 2,900 Gig Harbor residents commute other places for work. And about 9,400 folks from other parts of the region commute into Gig Harbor uh, for their jobs. And then on the right hand side, it includes a job count here. And this is a job count not for the jobs that are in Gig Harbor, but for the workers that live in Gig Harbor, regardless of where they are. So knowing the types of jobs that your residents work in and knowing what types of jobs you have in your community, you can help identify what jobs your residents are potentially leaving for. And this can also add some additional qualitative information to your understanding of who may be uh, you know, have a job in another location, but maybe working remotely in your community 
on part-time or a full-time basis. Next slide. Now touching upon workforce characteristics or population characteristics, understanding more about your local population can help inform important economic development policy decisions and understanding the educational level of the residents in your community can provide a baseline for what kinds of jobs may be a good fit, can help inform educational investments that you're considering and other workforce development policies as well. This uh, information is readily available uh, at the census, uh, but it can be found easily on PSRC's website as well. And we've got a tool that I want to highlight at the end of this where a lot of this information is aggregated. Next slide. Looking at other population characteristics can be helpful to understand the needs of your local economy. Understanding this can help you establish goals for the types of goods and services that you'd like to have or to help inform outreach and technical assistance efforts, knowing whether you have a, um, you know, a large retired population, whether you have a lot of young folks can help really determine what your business goals are for local goods and services and the businesses that are associated with them. Next slide. So next up, a couple of ways to identify economic inequities and gaps in economic opportunity. Understanding the level of income in your community and the number of households living in poverty is essential in understanding the economic health in your community. Understanding the differences and outcomes for different demographic groups can help inform how to address existing inequities and help inform the policies that you're pursuing. Next slide. In addition to knowing which populations are furthest from opportunity, it's also helpful to know what geographic areas in your community are furthest from opportunity. Opportunity mapping analyzes data such as educational levels, economic health, housing, transportation, health, the environment, a bunch of factors, provides information about where places have the most and least opportunity in your community. And PSRC has put together a really great opportunity mapping tool that's available on our website. Maggie, if you go to the next slide, we'll show a quick snapshot of that. You can see here at the census tract level, the scale of uh, you know most and least opportunity. On the right-hand side, there's a little breakout uh, for each of these geographic areas. You can see the rankings for these different uh, categories and some additional information as well. So I encourage you to take a look how your community is doing and how um, it compares to other parts of the region. Next slide. And the last group of data I'll talk about right now is about is related to availability and affordability of space for businesses. Um, data on the affordability of commercial and other space, as well as its actual availability, can be a great indicator of the risk of small business displacement. If you have a, a lack of commercial space, is the, uh, the the price continuing to rise? Um, you know, this has a tendency to drive out certain populations, smaller businesses, local ethnically focused businesses, et cetera. There are some proprietary data sources out there, such as CoStar, that tracks data for the commercial rental market. This is a subscription-based service if you really want to get in there and see exactly um, what, what spaces are available. But firms such as Kidder Matthews provide quarterly reports that analyze this data over larger subregions, so you can get a better sense of kind of where you are and what those displacement risks may be. Next slide. Uh, employment capacity is a measure of the number of jobs that can be accommodated given existing infrastructure and land. This can be helpful in knowing whether the economic de development goals that you're setting can be met given the existing conditions in your community. Will your community have the capacity to meet the job goals that you're setting, or do you have to think differently about uh, the zoning and space? Um, and county level buildable lands reports uh, uh, are, are a tool that you can use to help um, look further into this information. Next slide. And I'm going to kind of leave it here. So a lot of the things that I've talked about, especially data at the census level, are available um, on this uh, tool that we have on PSRC's website. It's in beta. It's been up and down a little bit since we've transitioned to our new website, but we hope to have this uh, up and running more consistently very soon. And it can provide a snapshot of many of the things that I've talked about. Um, you can take a look at your own community as well as some adjacent communities um, and compare yourselves to the region as well. So it's a good starting point for your analysis. Next slide. 
So that was a big data dump. It looks like we have a couple of questions queued up and we'll have a poll question after this, but Liz, do we have, can you find those questions for us? Yes, definitely. And thanks, Jason. That was a really good roundup. I think one of the things we discovered when working on the economic development element guide is it's hard to find a great roundup of data like this um, that's sort of all collected for the planning purpose. So uh, I think this is a great resource. Um, please feel free to pop in any additional questions. Um, We'll see if uh, you might have an answer for this. Craig might have an answer for this one too. Um, it's a good one. Uh, for the jobs household commute patterns, is there a similar tool for freight uh, where the product is being created, where it's traveling to, and what are the primary routes, including modes such as trucks, trains, or boats? The tool that I mentioned does not have that information. I'm not aware specifically of, of a tool that does that. Craig, you might have something in your your bag of tricks that that could be helpful with that. Can you think of anything? Okay, so it's a it's a great question. Maybe not nothing quite comes to mind uh, specifically, but uh, we're also doing an update to our industrial lands work, and so we'll have a little bit more information about um, some of this um, manufacturing and production uh, in the region as well. Um, a uh, question about whether we'll be able to receive a copy of the slides. Yes, we plan to distribute that um, to uh, participants after the session. Um, is there a resource that shows the gap in the workforce's educational? Wait, okay. The, shows the gap in the resources in the workforce's educational gap relative to the living wage or something along those lines. Mm, no, there's a couple of there's a couple of parts in there that are moving. Um, no, I think the simple answer is no. Um, I, I'll, I can take a look at that and see and, and follow up if there's anything, if there's any sort of things that I can connect after this presentation that might help uh, inform kind of thoughts around that. Great. Uh, another question about um, sort of accessing data for our city. Um, so I think uh, one of the things, one of the great resources is the community profiles, which I think Jason mentioned, we've had um, some issues sort of being up, or, up and down. We'll definitely also make sure that resource is available to folks so that you can sort of more easily access data for your jurisdiction. Um, I think those are some of the main questions we've gotten here. Um, so maybe we can move on and talk about the policy side and folks have additional data questions. We can pop those up in, in a bit. Great. The next slide here, yeah, is a poll is a poll question for you all. So this isn't a test. I want to you know add that as a background. We know that we believe that all these data points are can be really informative uh, to your local economy. Um, we also know that you have existing economic development elements and you're trying to figure out what to focus on. So we want to be able to be prepared to be helpful in the future. So we wanted to get a, a good sense of what are what data points from the ones that we've covered here and in the element guide might be of most interest to help us get a better understanding of where how we can be most helpful. So again, not a test, just where do you think um, some additional information and additional work might be might be useful in identi in kind of looking into some of these data points. Or some addition. If you've got some other thoughts, um, love to hear those as well. Oh, a bit of everything. Well, that's great. Um, yeah, we will. We can we can do some follow up in here, especially on those regional profiles, so you can get sort of that direct access to that great snapshot of the data that's available for your communities. Um, yeah, great. So we'll go into the next section here: developing economy policies. So. Is there, I think we've set a really great data foundation, both from the uh, kind of contextual data that Craig provided, and as well as a bunch of data sources that we think can be really helpful. We want to switch gears to policy development, and we're going to talk about the econ policies in vision and ways to approach developing the econ policies in your own comp plan. Um, as you'll see through here, there's a 
very comprehensive breadth of topics that that we connect with economic development that we have policies for at the regional level so next slide i'm going to start by just noting the adopted regional economy goal from vision and apologies for reading this the region has a prospering and sustainable regional economy by supporting businesses and job creation investing in all people in their health sustaining environmental quality and creating great central places diverse communities and a high quality of life you know, the region comes together and develops vision 2050 and i believe that we have a very comprehensive and holistic view of our of what our regional economy should be uh and the aspects in that and this is really reflective of all the ways uh that we think about our regional economy so thinking about you know, getting into the development of your uh, economy element, you know, this is an opportunity um, to, to add value to the work that you do. We know that, you know, you're not starting from scratch. There's already efforts underway. There's already things that you understand um, and documenting those in your economy element is an, is an important aspect of helping to inform local future uh, policy and funding decisions. Uh, there are, there they they are an opportunity to plan for coming economic growth and the changing needs of your community uh craig talked about the expected number of new residents new housing units new jobs in the region and of course we didn't get into it but it's sort of the general demographic shifts that the region um and the country and the world are going to be facing as people more people getting older retirement uh, smaller households etc so how is your community needs, needs are going to change over the the next you know few decades um and it helps it's an opportunity to help expand prosperity in your community addressing historic and existing inequities and economic outcomes and should really reflect your community's economic values to help direct the economic development work that you do in the future so it's not about coming up with the right answers but coming up with the you know the ways that your community thinks about economic development and integrating them into the policies next slide and the guidance that we put together and Maggie touched upon some of the resources that we have available we've put together the economic development guide in this presentation directly uh, built from the plan review manual the plan review manual lays out specifically what reviewers will be looking for in reviewing this section of the comprehensive plan and we've worked to be as specific as possible noting these uh, these checklist items here, useful data to look at, which we've talked about, considerations for policy development, as well as providing regional examples uh, of some good, uh, impactful and effective policies. Next slide. So what does change from Vision 2040 to Vision 2050? Many of you, as I mentioned before, as you know, many of you have an economic development element already, and you're looking to carry forward many of the policies that still work, that are still relevant. But you're also looking to identify, maybe from this, from conversations in your community about what you want to spend more time on. What are the areas that you need to focus on? Maybe have increase, increase understanding, develop new policies for. And so one of the ways that you're going to do that is by looking at seeing what's changed between Vision 2040 and Vision 2050. And so Vision 2050 has an increased policy focus on retention and recruitment of locally women and minority owned small businesses and environmentally sustainable businesses, expanding access to opportunity, addressing commercial displacement, promoting environmentally and socially responsible business practices, as well as recognizing the contributions of the region's cultural culturally and ethnically diverse communities, institutions, and native tribes. If you're interested, uh, there's a side-by-side -side comparison between 20 and 40 and 2050 policies that, that's linked here. Maggie linked to it at the beginning. This is something I always like to look to. What specifically has changed? What's the scale of that change? How can that help inform where we want to focus our resources and efforts in the update process? Next slide. And so that's what's changed. Those seven, uh, those seven items that we showed on, on that breakout are the main policy objectives laid out in vision around economic development and the plan review manuals you see here. And that's how we're gonna organize the rest of our discussion here today. They are identifying industries to grow, recruiting, retaining, and expanding businesses, expanding access to opportunity, mitigating displacement of businesses, expanding availability of jobs for residents, promoting responsible business practices, 
and leveraging local cultural assets. So we're going to review each, we're going to highlight some considerations in policy development, and point out some good regional examples and, and importantly, why they work. Next slide. The first policy objective in a little bit more detail laid out specifically uh, what's in the, the plan review manual is to identify and enhance industry clusters, including those recognized in the regional economic strategy that provide goods and services for export. Vision recognizes that there are key export industries in the region that we should work to enhance. Tapping into these industry sectors and the well-paying jobs associated with them can help our region and communities meet their economic development goals. Also, whether you're tar targeting these industries or other more locally focused industries, having targets for your job growth are more attainable if they're more specific to specific industries. Next slide. So how do you get there? What are some policy considerations when you're sitting down to do this work? First, identify and leverage any specific economic assets that you already have in your community, like industrial areas, like community colleges, ports, airports, important employment centers. You can recognize any local supply chains and the industries that they are connected to. These industries can be an additional focus for your economic development goals. Identifying the partners that you are working with or you could work with, uh, such as industry organizations, educational institutions, or major employers, and as a resource, look to other economic development plans at the state, county, and regional level. The, your county has economic development plans. We have the regional economic strategy as a resource as well. Next slide. And so the element guide identifies policy examples across each of the objectives that we're talking about. And two examples here um, for this policy objective. First policy from Paulsbo works because it identifies the maritime industry and identifies the port of Paulsbo as a key partner and even lays out specific infrastructure investments that are needed um, to, to implement this policy. The policy from Tacoma identifies a number of specific export focused industries to target investment. So both kind of lay out a clear path of, of, of where these communities think that their opportunities lie. Next slide. The second objective is to focus retention and recruitment efforts and activities to foster a positive business climate uh, and diversify employment opportunities by specifically targeting businesses that provide living wage jobs, locally women and minority owned businesses and startup companies, established and in emerging industries, technologies and services that promote environmental sustainability, especially those addressing climate change and resiliency. So this, this one is, is very specific. There's lots of detail in here, noting uh, uh, many of the specific policies that are laid out in vision. Next slide. So what are the, some things that you can focus on at the local level? Like clearly this is, uh, this objective is all about focus. There's a lot of detail. There's a recognition, um, your limited resources that you have to target the, the work that you're doing in many ways. So this is a way to focus on how you can approach business recruitment and retention given, given those limited resources. Some of that work that you do uh, related to recruitment, re retention and expansion, you may do directly in your community, or you may have partnerships with local organizations such as those county level ADOs, Chamber of Commerce, maybe a partnership with your, with your county. Of course, your business recruitment and expansion goals should align with your other economic policies around industries, economic opportunity, et cetera. So this is a way that all of those policies kind of come together and determine how you're going to implement um, some of the resources that you have to make it real. Um, so, and also think about how you can leverage other work that you're doing in these recruit, recruitment, retention, and expansion efforts. Um, do you have branding and marketing that you do for your, your jurisdiction? Can they help focus on what your, what your targeted industries are? You know, what are the partnerships that you, that you have or that you're looking to expand? Can they be designed to align better with the economic development goals that you have? Next slide. So some example, Paulsville again. Uh, Paulsville has a policy detailing recruitment activities they perform, so it's very specific and very actionable. Bremerton's policy is a little bit different and here identifies a goal of diversification and also aligns with their local growth goals targeting existing centers. Next slide. 
The third objective is to promote strategies and policies that expand access to opportunity and remove barriers for economically disconnected communities. Vision recognizes that access to opportunity plays a significant role in life outcomes. And there are barriers that exist both demographically and geographically in our region and others, uh, current and historical. Next slide. So there are many different things to consider when you're working on developing or expanding your policies. Your local education policies can play a role in expanding economic opportunity. Identifying and targeting low opportunity geographic areas for infrastructure investments, program investments, and outreach can be a pathway to improve economic conditions there. And one of the strategies that many jurisdictions look to take is to be more deliberate with how their public funds are spent and how government contracting is done. So this is another thing to think about. Next slide. Seattle's policy here creates a prioritization for assistance activities to areas of low opportunity, as well as focusing on small businesses. And note that these policies don't have to detail any and all programs that you'd look to leverage over the lifespan of this comprehensive plan, but it provides the foundation for future programmatic and budgetary decisions. Tacoma's policy recognizes the potential impact of its government contracting dollars and is specifically targeting improving access to certain groups. So how do you connect groups that may not have participated as much to these contracting opportunities and make sure that they're at the table, that they're aware of these opportunities and that they have the opportunity to apply. Next slide. The fourth objective laid out is to address and prevent potential physical, economic, and cultural displacement of existing businesses that may result from redevelopment and market pressure. But we all recognize that rising real estate costs are impacting the housing market, but they're not only impo impacting the housing market as well, but also our commercial spaces. There's pressure on these you know, employment areas that have been maybe being driven to housing. With any limited resource, there are some populations that are gonna miss out. There are fewer spaces, they're more expensive. Small business owners are gonna be more at risk of being displaced when these pressures come in. Next slide. So as planners, from a planning perspective, zoning can be a powerful tool to help preserve commercial spaces or create size restricted spaces to protect some of these local businesses. Programs such as relocation assistance or assistance with facade improvements can help maintain your existing small businesses. How do you hang on to the businesses that you have to keep them from being displaced? And of course, identifying ways to do outreach and provide technical assistance can be a focus for policies as well. Identify those businesses that you really want to help preserve and reach out and find ways um, to help meet their specific needs. Next slide. Gig Harbor has a really great policy that covers two important elements. First is the promotion of financing and assistance programs targeted at small businesses in their community. And the second is something a bit different, identifying facilities that could be suitable for small business startups. So what can the city do? What can your local jurisdiction do to be creative in finding spaces that, that can help maintain and sustain these businesses in your community? And Renton here has a policy to identify new tools to help develop affordable spaces for small businesses to help prevent commercial displacement. There is no sort of turnkey solution here, uh, but clearly Renton is putting a focus on making this a priority and continue, continuing to investigate and examine what, what tools they can bring to bear to help uh, prevent commercial displacement in their communities. Uh, next slide. The fifth objective is to develop a range of employment opportunities to create a closer balance between jobs and housing. So Vision 2050 and the Regional Growth Strategy strive to achieve a better jobs housing balance. And accomplishing this can provide many community benefits, including economic ones. You will have housing goals, of course, in your housing section that can work to improve this balance. But in your economic development section, focusing on expanding job opportunities that match to local workers can be an important tool to help reach this goal as well. And we talked about that on the map tool, which I think has a lot of uh, great information to help you figure out what some of those targets could be. Next slide. Some policy considerations. Your policies should consider and be thoughtful about the residents in your community that commute to other places for work, especially those that are commuting long distances. Um, and again, tapping into that on the map tool, I think is a really great way to get there. Next slide. 
I think there's a lot more to be that our that our communities can do to think about how to um, you know promote that jobs housing balance to better match jobs to local communities. Gig Harbor has a good core policy that relates to this, keeping a goal of better jobs housing balance as part of their economic development goals. So they recognize that this is a goal, um, and more work for all of us to do to help help meet that goal. Next slide. The sixth objective is to promote environmental and socially responsible business practices, especially those addressing climate change, resilience, and improved health outcomes. Vision recognizes that the region's natural environment is an important asset for our continued economic success. It's an important aspect of our region's quality of life, which has always been a great attractant uh, for people moving here, for businesses moving here, and for people continuing to want to live here. Policies can also focus on the development of businesses and industries that are working to address resilience and climate change. As I mentioned before, the state and other organizations are working to grow these industries and your local economic development plans can look to elevate or to leverage that focus. If there's investments in growing particular industries in the region, um, maybe that's a good, good way to you know, take advantage of the work that you're doing to, to leverage the investments that other folks are making. Next slide. So we can recognize that any single community in the region has a small part to play in protecting our regional and global environment, but you do have some important things that you can focus on and work that you can do at the local level. Prioritizing responsible and sustainable business practices can be a way that your community expresses its values through your comprehensive plan. Um, what does your community want? What do they want reflected in, in your local economic development policies? Maybe your community leverages its natural environment for for you know, key events that you have in your community or for tourism opportunities or is adjacent to you know, a natural environment that is a good, in your community is a good stopping point for hiking or other kind of recreational activities. These can be ways that you can think about uh, the regional and, and global economy in your work. And again, consider targeting industries that are focused on resiliency and climate change and as part of your, your recruitment goals. These are new opportunities for businesses, new opportunities for industries. Um, and a lot of work is being done to help grow those industries here in the region. Next slide. Both Everett and Renton have really great and specific policies. They're targeting businesses that are working to address climate change. So they're just straight up calling out the, the areas that they want to focus on, which is, which is perfect. Next slide. Uh, and the seventh and final uh, objective that we have listed in, in here is to support, recognize, and empower the contributions of the region's culturally and ethnically diverse communities, institutions, and native tribes. These communities, institutions, and native tribes are a key part of the region's identity as well as our economic success. And this is going to be a bit different in every community. You know, each jurisdiction is going to be different in terms of which communities and assets that are in place. And you know, you know, with the outreach that you're doing and the local expertise, you're really going to be the experts on how to how to best leverage those for your economic development goals. Next slide. So recognizing these communities, ensuring that outreach is being done to these communities, as well as setting specific goals and policies, are important aspects of the role that you play. You can look to identify opportunities to support new existing cultural events, supporting local arts and culture institutions, supporting local ethnic you know, uh, business groups and chambers of commerce can have important community and economic uh, benefits. Next slide. Seattle's policy here recognizes the importance of arts and culture as a key element to attracting workers, employers, and tourists to their community. So we know that things are not just about quality of life. To help ensure that we have a strong economy and well as well. And Port Orchard's policy here highlights the importance of partnerships of all types uh, in their community's economic success. And this is a this is a lesson that we can apply to many of the policies that we talk about. You know, how do you take advantage and create partnerships uh, in your community uh, to help meet your economic development goals? So uh, as you've seen here that the econ policies and vision span a wide range of topics with lots of opportunities. There are lots of ways for your community to think about where your strengths lie, where you want to focus on. Um, but it's up to you to determine which of these opportunities you're really going to dig into and take advantage of. And again, there's more information in the element guide. And, and as we mentioned, these slides will be available after this presentation as well. So 
We're going to have time for Q&A, uh, and we have another poll question. But before that, we've invited someone who's not me to come and talk a little bit about economic development planning. Uh, Maggie introduced Rob Allen at, at, the, at the top of the session here. He's an economic development specialist at Pierce County. Uh, he's currently working on the economic development element. And I know many of you are new to this, but Rob also has the luxury of going back and addressing work that he's done in the past. So he, he is one of the more experienced folks in the region. So we wanted to have Rob come and, and tell you a little bit about some things to consider, maybe a little bit of a pep talk, some, some ways that you can um, you know, really you know, be efficient in the work that you're doing in a, in a really impactful way. So Rob, thanks for joining us. Take a few minutes and then just hand it back to me when you're done and we can do some group Q&A. Great, thanks Jason and, and welcome to everybody that joined us today. Glad to see a good turnout and, and that people are really interested and excited in this, in this topic. Um, Pierce County has been, you know, we've included uh, an economic development element I think since our very first comprehensive plan back in the early 90s when it was still just an optional element. Um, and you know, I think one of the one of the first keys is um, understand what economic development means for your jurisdiction. <clears throat> um, everything that that we do as humans, you can think of in economic terms. And so that kind of means that anything you do is economic development to somebody. So before you start developing your, your economic element, you kind of have to decide what economic development means for you and for your, for your jurisdiction. Um, Jason and his group did a great job in putting together the, the resource, the, um, the resource guide. I think it could be really useful and, and really helpful. It's a great starting point, I think, for, for most people, especially if you haven't developed an economic development element uh, in the past. One of the keys, I think, is to work with the partners in your community. And Jason highlighted most of those folks. Um, in addition to the ADOs, if you have a port district, um, work with them. They do a lot of work in economic development as well. And, you know, most of them have some sort of strategic plan that can be a great starting point for developing policies. And, you know, at the very least, make sure that your policies don't conflict with those plans. So try to be as um, you know, as compatible as you can and, and incorporate the work that other people are already doing. And sort of in the same vein, make sure that your economic development policies and plans are consistent with the other parts of your comprehensive plan. So, you know, if, if you want to say, you know, we, we want to grow our, our industrial jobs by you know, 150%, but you don't have any industrial land zoned, well, that's, that's an issue. So you gotta be really aware of um, the infrastructure investments that are going to be made, what the plans are for, for other things your city or your jurisdiction is doing and make sure that they're all consistent. I think another key is understanding what's the intent behind the policies that you're developing. So are they just to allow or sort of anticipate what people are doing or is it more proactive than that? And, and so if you're going to be actively, you know, writing policies that suggest actively doing something, um, it, you know, whether it's recruitment or retention, who is going to do that work? So you're writing this into your jurisdiction's economic plan, but is the, it, is the jurisdiction the people that are actively doing this work? So you need to work with the people who are, you, you think are going to be, be making these things happen. And I think another important thing, this is especially true for smaller jurisdictions, those that are, are um, you know, 
rural or, or disconnected from, from the urban areas. Um, understand who the, the really important employers are in your community. And, and so they may not be related at all to kind of those regional priority industries, but they can be really important for your community. So they may be a large employer or just someone who is really connected to the community. You know, they, they support the, the little league team and, they, and, and they're very active in helping grow the community and define the community's character. So understand those employers, reach out to them and, and think about, ask them about what is important to them and what do they see as keys to developing the economy in your jurisdiction. So, um, you know, I, I thought that I had a lot of things to say, but Jason really said most of them. And, and so really take to heart his comments and, and use Jason and his group as a resource for how you develop your plans. Because um, I, I really do think that they put together a good guide and it's a good starting point. So, um, Jason, with that, I'll give it back to you. I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Great. Thank you so much, Rob. Liz, are you going? I'm looking at the questions as well. Do you want me to run through these or you want to go through them? Either way. Um, I'm happy to happy to go through them. Um, I'll okay. just flag it. There's a question I may have missed earlier about jobs housing balance um, and the dynamics of um, kind of employed uh, population versus retirees. So uh, I guess maybe a question for Jason of like, is there data about the share of working population um, in consideration of jobs housing ratio? Yeah, Jennifer, I think this is you. Um, looking back, yeah, I think I tried to I tried to sort of set a, a level of expectation with the jobs housing ratio. I think there are continual conversations about how something like that can be better and more informative. You know, in that you know some of that data in the on the map tool, it, that is more of a reflection of jobs and workers, which might be a different way to think about. The number of jobs that you need in the in the community and the number of in the number of housing units um, but yeah there's not a perfect measure for that um, but i think thinking about what you can do is more important uh, than figuring out different ways to to look at it but you know there's there are different ways if you want to sort of have your own specific community goals about um, which housing units looking at your pot taking consideration working working age population as well, but I'd really encourage you to look more at what those specific opportunities are than just stick to this, this high level measure. Great, um, next question. For cities that have an economic development plan or strategy, how specific and actionable should the policies be? Uh, it seems they should be broader and point in the direction while the actual policies would be in the economic development plan. Right, and and Liz, feel free to jump into from a bro kind of a broader sense. Many when we were preparing for this and developing the guide, we recognize that uh, some communities have their comp plan and have policies in their comp plan around economic development. Other communities, you know, larger ones that have different kind of resources, have a more detailed plan around economic development that that provide a lot more detail about the programs investments and strategies to implement those policies so there's a bit of an art in there but i think one of the things that you're pointing on is right like these should be you know they are policies but they they're 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 your guiding principles that you're going to carry through the work that you're doing over the next 10 years to help inform the specific you know the nimbleness of the investments, the programs, the projects that you're undertaking over the over the next ten years. So, Liz, is there anything else you would like to add to that? It seems like there's a bit of an art here, rather than a hard science and exactly the level of detail that you're putting, uh, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think it really depends on kind of your jurisdiction, like whether you have a, a separate, more more detailed strategy. Um, and I mean, I think the more de more precise you can be in policy, that the easier it is to kind of like measure over time and figure out whether you're sort of actually implementing it. But um, yeah, it really depends on kind of the the broader context of your plan and kind of like the tone and, and what other plans you may have uh, to implement. 
Um, there's another uh, kind of comment in here about um, the PSRC should um, look at tax changes that promote equity across the region. So I think the question here is really about kind of the role of PSRC in terms of legislative agenda. So it does maybe a question for Jason, um, does the Economic Development District Board set a legislative agenda? Is there, is that part of the conversation here? We don't, you know, these are, these are complicated issues that I don't, you know, that that would require a lot of regional discussion to come up with specifically uh, tax proposals. And I and um, the, the Economic Development District Board has not taken such a, a kind of a specific role in the past around specific tax changes. Oftentimes, if there are new um, investments or programs or, or policies that are coming up that the Economic Development District Board would weigh in on those. This seems like it re would require um, a, a broader amount of analysis before any recommendations could could come out of that. So definitely something we will share internally uh, with our leadership here to, to talk about um, what role we might wanna play at PSRC around recommendations for tax structure changes. Yeah, and, it, and while it's not maybe addressed in the CPPs or the MPPs, certainly if an individual jurisdiction wants to use their comp plan to sort of explore ideas for legislative changes, that's that's certainly up to you as well. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in. So um, I know you've got a couple of polls, Jason, so you want, if I may pass it back to you on this. Yeah, um, Maggie, so Maggie move forward. So everybody's doing things for me here. And then we have a poll similar to the data uh, question earlier. Uh, we don't want to uh, have this be a test, but thinking about how, how helpful we can be. Uh, we have some examples here of different things that um, we think might be areas that local jurisdictions might want to focus on in their in their plan updates. And if you have any insights into some of those things that you are expecting to put some additional work in, might want to reach out to us to ask questions on, could use additional guidance or data this is a great time to highlight those that and, and we can look to provide some assistance going forward after this session so identifying your economic niche and those policies you know targeting specific industries do you have unique economic assets like a local community college that you just love to you know learn more about how, the, how other folks are leveraging um, do you need help developing or implementing business expansion, recruitment, retention, uh, exp expansion programs? Is it the jobs housing balance and, and telework, you know, identifying ways that you can better take advantage of, of workers that may be in your communities that otherwise commute either part-time uh, or not at all to a job location and a desk other places, uh, addressing economic inequities, examining them, coming up with solutions, or are you challenged with commercial displacement? Or are you worried about commercial displacement and are and are interested in, in having more help in exploring that? So uh, every answer is great. Just, just a little bit of a way for us to kind of know where people are at and, and think about ways that we can be helpful. Great, a little more variation here than in the data. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Uh, Maggie, I think we're going to go to the next slide here, which may be our wrap up. Yeah, so again, thanks for joining, joining us today. Um, we have a general email. Sorry to jump in, Maggie, but uh, you can reach out to me if you have questions that are specific to economic development. If you're unsure or just want to, you know, kind of cover your bases, you can reach out to the plan review email as well. Um, but I should be easy to find, happy to field any questions if you need help with data, if you need help with policy. Um, and, and thanks for attending. And, and Maggie, sorry, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you, Jason. And thank you to everyone who attended today. We have a few more questions to ask you all. So we'll launch that first question here. We asked you at the beginning of the webinar how you were feeling um, about your comprehensive planning process. We're kind of wondering how you're feeling after the workshop um, and to really get a sense of how we're doing. Um, and then I will also point out after the meeting ends today, we are going to launch our 
Title VI survey. This is just for us to have more information on the demographics of people um, attending these webinars. So this really fulfills our um, Title VI requirements as an agency. And we are um, handling that information as confidentially as possible on our end. So please fill that out after the webinar. Uh, it looks like people are planning to attend future deep dive sessions. That is great. We have a lot of those planned and we are putting a lot of work into those. I'm going to transition us over to our next question here. Um, and this is just an open-ended feedback question. If you have any on today's webinar or future webinars, you could go to that question. Um, and then just as a reminder, all of the presentations from today's webinar, as well as the recording will be sent out via email to everyone who registered for today's event. Uh, it, they'll also be available on our website once we have those ready. Um, and then you can always reach out to us at the plan review email if you have any questions um, on your plan review process, on resources and guidance documents we have available. Um, as well as uh, if you start to have draft elements you'd like us to review early on in the process, um, we can talk about the process for doing that too. So thank you all. Um, I'm going to leave this up for a few more seconds so we can get any of that feedback from you and you're welcome to email us any feedback too. Um, and then please fill out that Title VI survey that should be launched when this meeting ends.